Yeah. Is it four o'clock by your watch? All right. So hello everybody and uh, welcome and uh, to all you guys streaming online as, as well, welcome. Uh, my name's Stuart Weston, I'm a commercial fashion photographer and what I'd like to talk about today is using a backdrop of my images from the very beginning to, which is, of course is all analogue and probably of very little interest to most of you, but hopefully it will get more interesting, uh, to the present day and the impact of the digital technology on my career. Uh, and I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, possibilities as well for the technology, what may be happening in the future as indicated by current day trends. So, first of all, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I got into the industry, because of course there's, what's, what's also, what I, I want to see here is, you know, there's this, uh, the word entrepreneur is used again and again and again in this environment. Whereas uh, my daughter, Melissa, who happens to be sat here, my biggest fan, thank you very much, is, uh, you know, this is, the, this is her environment, this is what she works in. She pointed out earlier that she regards me as an entrepreneur in that I did other things before I became a photographer. In fact, I started quite late. I was, uh, I was 30 before I actually took it up quite seriously. Uh, my first job was uh, as an aerospace engineer for British Aerospace. And after working very hard on an apprenticeship, found myself on the shop floor wearing a a hairnet and steel toe cap boots and overalls and hating every minute of it. So I basically the way I got going was I didn't know anything about assisting or I knew nothing about the industry. I basically bought a camera. And when it fell into my hands, I just felt this is the right thing for me. And then I lied, basically. Uh, I just knocked on doors. So, I mean, if you've got a camera around your neck, right? And I say to you, I say, my name's Stuart West and I'm a photographer. Very nice to meet you. Well, yeah, well of course you are, aren't you? You're a photographer. Yeah, so. Now, they say, you, you know, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all of the time. So, you need some substance behind that. So, the early days were very, very difficult. A lot of testing, a lot of experimenting, a lot of knocking on doors. So, so here we are, past, present and future. So now, in the, very, in the very early days, for some reason, I don't know why, I can't explain it, but I was very much attracted to uh, a certain format of camera, which should have come up next, but this computer decided to do something different. So let's go back a little bit, shall we? Okay, I began shooting on 5.4. Now, are you guys photographers? Well, you know what, that's a silly question. Everybody's a photographer now. Yeah? Everybody, yeah? So, but you might not know about this. You know, remember the old camera where you stick your head under, under a blanket and the picture's upside down and back to front? That's the 5.4 format. I felt very comfortable with that, but the problem with that commercially is that you're not looking through a camera to take the picture. What you're doing is you're looking with your eyes. You, you create the composition, you get everything exactly as you want it. You're forced to look. It's about detail, you know, every hand, every movement. So what you're doing is you're honing your compositional skills. And when you've composed the picture as you want it, that's when you record it. So commercially, this is a problem because instead of shooting bang, 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 and then editing the film and giving the shot to the client, You've already done all this in your head. What you're giving the client is your final picture. So you give the client one picture and then they say, where are my pictures? <laughs> they don't like it, you know, they, they don't call again. So now right now, you and I are on a mystery tour because this beam is doing something weird. So let's see where we go, shall we? And I'll talk about it. All right, whoa. Now. I did a seminar yesterday in Germany, and when I brought this picture up, most of the audience went, because oh, it changed everything for so many people. It changed my world. Now, the style of picture that interested me 
on the 5.4 Polaroid was very paint-like. It was, it was kind of old, it was etherical. But I needed, I, the irony is I needed this new technology to realize those images. I needed to scan them and then retouch them and output them on the Mac. And of course, anybody who's ever gotten their first computer, remember the first time you retouch a picture? It gets to three o'clock in the morning. You, yeah, and, you, you, and it's just, it's endless, isn't it? You become obsessed and then you go to sleep and then you close your eyes and, and you're still retouching. And then you see a friend tomorrow at lunchtime, they've got a little crumb on their face and you think, I could retouch that. Yeah. <laughs> You start, you start to go a little bit nuts with it. Okay, yeah, so this is some of the earlier work on Polaroid. Hang on a minute. This is my friend Colin, he's always late. Colin, you're late, I'm on stage. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, just to go back now. Now, what the Mac allowed me to do was something which has been a bit of a signature of mine ever since, is I, I like to, providing that it adds something to the image and doesn't become a distraction, is trying to take the image somewhere else. And, and I do that by layering. So, for example, in this picture, which was for the Times, you see, I've put a background in there. It, it was shot against a simple grey background, but I put a shot in there. And, of course, I couldn't have done that with my, without my Epsom scanner and my little iMac at the time. So here's some more examples of that earlier style. Still in the analog era in terms of the way I was shooting. And then it's all on large format Polaroid film and then scanned. Oh, there is some nudity in this presentation, so I hope nobody's offended by the human body. So. Now talking about that, the thing is you see, the Polaroid, the beauty of the Polaroid was, is that it helped me communicate with the subject. Because this lady felt very, very secure once she saw, I'd taken a Polaroid and you'd pin them up on a board so they could dry. And she's like, okay, that's what the guy's doing. So it was a communication tool it was useful. Now, of course, we have the little display in the back of the camera, which does a similar job, but it's not quite as convincing. Again, I'm morphing backgrounds into the work. And this was important to me as well, in that shooting on that format helped me refine my compositional skills, as I said earlier, because it's so slow. It's not about shooting, it's about looking and recording. Also, you had to hone certain technical skills as well, because I couldn't just layer things in layers in Photoshop as we do now. I had to work out the exposures. And you can't read for that kind of light. It's a, a lot of it's intuitive. Because there are seven exposures in this picture. So you imagine if you expose that background seven times, then how do you work that out? So you build an image by almost guessing you're feeling the light. And the only way to do that is by working on a, a format like the large format, which is very, very considered. This is early experimentation now with the same format. It's very early work. But now what I'm doing is I'm working on neg film and putting neg through transparency baths or transparency film through negative processing. Now, I see a couple of blank faces in the audience, especially among the younger guys, because E6, C, C41 processing must mean nothing to you, yeah? Okay, well, that's the process by which you develop the film. It's chemicals. So what you're doing is you're messing with the chemistry. You're forcing film to do something it shouldn't do. So I'll get to your era soon, okay? So bear with me, please, and anybody else who just finds this a little bit baffling. So this is very early work. I was always very experimental. I still try to be. Now the problem with this format is, as I said, clients were unhappy with the format because it gave them little choice. And so they got a little bit pissed off, they didn't call again. So let's move on a little bit. 
And then Neg became a bit of a fad, but to me it lacked resolution. This is negative work. It's beautiful work, has a nice enough feeling, but really things needed to change. And everything changed when digital came along. This is early work for Brazilian Vogue. This is all shot on negative film, scanned in. This is, because we're in the UK, maybe, maybe many of you guys know Lily Cole. So this was, uh, this was her first shoot. I went to the agency, I saw this funny looking kid with a round face and the bright red hair. And nobody had shot her before. And I wanted to shoot her for Brazilian Vogue and the client were like, no, nah, no way. So, so let's, just to go back, so I thought, well, if I, stick some, if I stick some older guys in there, then maybe they'll go for it, and they did. Now, so that's her first shoot. She turned up chewing gum, like, on her own, 16 years old. Yeah, what do you want me to do? I said, well, just stand there, you know, and this is what we do, and that's the first shoot. Second shoot was Stephen Meisel for Italian Vogue, and then, but then we all know the rest, you know. Clever girl, too. Very, very bright. So, my introduction to digital. Pay attention now, yeah? yeah. All right. Hasselblad, for me, were the first camera outfit to come along that made sense for me. Economically, it made sense, despite the enormous cost at the time of the camera. That camera, my first one was uh, oh, 27, 28,000 pounds. It's a lot of money, hard to justify, unless you're spending 40,000 a year in the lab. And then don't forget, every time you take a picture on film, you had to go back to the lab and get a drum scan to get it into your computer. So you had to be very particular, you know, you had to, out of 36 shots, you might only edit it down to two, and then get two into the system. Whereas with this, every single time you press the shutter, it's in your Mac. So it made, makes a lot of sense now. And also it started making me think, what, what can I do with this new tool as well? And how does it compare? And when I, when I first got the camera, I had my 5.4, because I didn't believe it. And I had the Hasselblad, and I shot the same shot on the Hasselblad on the 5.4, and then compared the results. And the Hasselblad was far superior, much, much better. So here we are, so this is the beginning of the shot, okay? And now I start to layer graphics on top, in layers, because I, I like playing with graphics, I, I love it, I love graphic design. And I end up with this. But then it has enormous commercial advantages too. So I'm shooting winter collections. The way the industry works, my industry works, they're always out of season. We're always shooting autumn, winter, and spring, summer. We're always shooting spring, summer, or trying to, and autumn, winter, it's more difficult. So here we are, we're in Wales, North Wales, and Mount Snow, and it's in June, but the brief is snow and winter, and you know, it's, well, that's what we're selling. So, okay, fine, so I make it a little cooler, and then I have some shots from Canada of some mountains, I layer those on. And then, okay, now the client's happy. So, you know, they say more winter. They always say more. I was like, uh, no, 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 more, more. And okay, all right. And then they go, okay, that's it. All right. So the manipulation in this way for me is a useful commercial tool and useful for my clients. Now, there's a, there's a nice story behind this picture. I was in Iceland when the... Uh, when the glacier broke up, when the, when the volcano went off. I was there before the clients to check out the locations and the production. They were supposed to fly out the day after the volcano went. Now, I was on the glacier. I was, I think, I'm pretty sure, and I'm bragging here, yeah, but I'm pretty sure that I was the last person on it. And what happened was the sky got really weird. And I don't know if anybody's been to Iceland here, but... The weather can change like that, and it can kill you. So if you're off-road and you're on your own, you take lots of chocolate bars and extra clothing and liquids. And I'm two, two, two and a half hours off-road in a Land Rover, checking out this location, and the sky went really, really weird. And 
and I just I felt really uncomfortable. I thought I better get out of here. So I got off there, and next thing the whole the whole place goes up, and then the client can't fly out. So I'm stuck there for two weeks on my own with a Land Rover. No, don't pull your face. It was brilliant. It was great. All expenses paid. Yeah. <laughs> And so all I, all I can do is go out every day and just take pictures of this, just this amazing stuff that's going on all the time. And that's what I did for two weeks till I finally got a flight to Edinburgh and then we went back there the following month. Now when the client came back out, the weather was flat, grey sky, you couldn't see any mountains, it was, it was dull. There was nothing exciting about it at all. I said, it's no problem, I already have it. And now I've got two helicopters, you know? It's, so, now, now this is a serious question. Now, so, is this manipulation dishonest? Well, the answer is yes, it is, isn't it? But more importantly, is it harmful? Well, there are always going to be individuals out there who are vulnerable. There are always going to be individuals out there who are vulnerable and ready to be exploited. There's always going to be the exploiters. There's all, you know what I mean? We're, we've all read about it for, forever. So, yes, it, it can be in the wrong hands. But I think in terms of me helping a client realize their dream and, you know, keep people in jobs, I think that's OK to put a bit of snow in, whatever. I, I don't think it's OK to put an image out there that makes a, a vulnerable an impressionable young woman feel like she should be a certain idealized vision that I don't believe in. So, moving on. So I get more of the same sort of thing. It's not, I've not messed around with this image too much. Uh, I've just put a little bit of mist in there just to make it a little bit more atmospheric. Now, this is an interesting story again, very similar to the Iceland situation. It's the same client. We were shooting in, uh, Victoria, uh, British Columbia, off, uh, which is a peninsula off Vancouver. And uh, the brief was they wanted mountains and lots of snow. It's the same sort of deal. Okay, that's what they do. But they didn't, without consulting me, they booked the hotel in Victoria. Five hours drive. Five hours drive from any mountain. It's flat. There's nothing there. So it they made the job impossible. But I was there before the clients again, checking out the locations and doing the production. So what I did without telling them, yeah, I'm showing off a bit again. I know, I'm sorry, but we'll put that to one side for a minute because it all sounds very glamorous. It's not all like this. But I hired an aeroplane. I hired this and a pilot. I should have told you I flew it myself, but I didn't anyway. So I hired a pilot. And, and I went up into the mountains and, and just shot out the door, you know, with the door open, shooting the mountains as we flew around, banked around, and then landed on some of the lakes and shot in the lakes. And then when the client came out, I said, listen, guys, I think you've really made a bit of a mistake here. You've messed up because there are no mountains here. And the client's horrified, of course, because they spend a lot of money. They plan a lot. And, Everybody's there waiting to go all excited and I'd tell them that they're not going to get any pictures with mountains unless I say to them, I've done this and if you like it, then you pay for it. If you don't like it, I'll pay for it because I had a ball. So I showed them an example of a shot with and without the mountains. This is what you've got, but this is what I can do with it. And of course, then they're delighted. So again, is this dishonest? Yes, but does it matter? Has anybody got a problem with that? No, not me neither. So, so that mountain's not there, in other words. Okay? Sorry, excuse me. This gentleman has a problem with that. <laughs> There's always one, isn't there? <laughs> that mountain's not there, of course. So now you know the trick. That volcano's not there. That's not there either. So, another side of my career is the commercial side. There, there are different sides. As a photographer, I always want to do the creative work but life is not like that it's not very rewarding you know every time I get more creative I get more broke so I need to I need to earn a living of course so this is some examples of commercial work and the best one can hope to do with the commercial side 
is leave at least a signature, some kind of small signature on the work. And some of the calls are really quite odd. I got a call from Satchi saying, Stuart, we'd really like you to do a campaign for a loaf of bread. I'm like, okay, all right. Why, how, I don't know, but well, these are the results. I'm really quite happy with them. I'll just scroll through these. It's fairly generic, but you can see how I'm using layering again. And it's very accessible now because of the digital media. I actually have thousands of images now. I shoot on this. I've been doing it today. If I see something interesting, I just run around with this little boy and just pop, 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 pop. And then I don't know what I'm going to do with it. But so I have different folders, those with of architectural interest, those that may be classic and so on and so forth. And they always come in useful. I work for clients such as uh, L'Oreal, Tony and Guy. This is a client in Paris called Jean-Marc Joubert. This is, you probably, most of you know, the, those of you from London certainly know Rush, the hairdressing group. This one, uh, hairdresser of the year. This is a bridal client, Ian Stewart. I do, I do particularly like the romance, the fantasy of, of what I do. It's, I'm not, I'm not really on, you know, I'm not a cool cutting edge photographer. I prefer mileage. This is very, this is all very new. This is for Monsoon with Glamour magazine. Has anybody got any questions so far? You've been very quiet. Yes. Lighting hasn't evolved at all over time. To, as for, for me, personally, the equipment has, but lights light. Yeah. Certainly shooting outdoors, it's not evolved at all, really. Right. Well, it may have done slightly, but I don't <laughs> think we're going to notice that. And, you know, maybe we need to talk to a quantum physicist about no, that. Just, if, you say, if you look at the Interior Design magazine, they've got squillions of articles now about evolution and lighting and how you can do it, get things yeah you can yes you can do I think domestically but the equipment you see the equipment I use is older than you a lot of it it's it's old it's it, the older it gets the cheaper it gets so the more of it I can have so when a pack blows up I throw it away I don't worry about it there's a there's a lot of old equipment out there partly because a lot of people are, in every respect have to have the very latest thing but a light's a light for me it doesn't make certain lights have different qualities flashlight compared to continuous light and there are different types of continuous light have a different quality but as a photographer it's important to develop your style to have a recognizable style a signature but if you're changing your lighting all the time you're not going to achieve that so if a client sees this work and they think well not that because it happens to be daylight but if it's a studio lit shot then they go we like the way Stuart Weston lights that so it's the same lighting, it's consistent for me. But all that happens is, all that's happened as far as I can see is, the equipment simply has more and more features in the same way that my camera has gone from having ISO, aperture and shutter speed. That's all I need. Now my camera does, it's got buttons on it I've never pressed and I never dare press. I don't need them, I don't want them, I'm scared. They, they just add features, more and more and more and more features. So I see features added, but at the end of the day, it's a light bulb going pop. So what do I, how many features do I need? So hopefully that answers your question. Cool. I, I, many things aren't necessary. Yeah, are they? <laughs> this is just daylight. In post-production, I've added the reflection of the girl in the glasses. Just to add a little bit of, so you, can, you get the feeling there might be some kind of relationship there in the image. This is quite old, Jenny Packham. This is a good story. This, this, this kind of thing happens a lot. I went to Italy to shoot for this brand. It's a men's shirt brand, quite formal shirts. And they wanted a studio shoot, they booked the studio. We went in the studio, I had the guys there, the shirts. I shot the job, I finished it about, about lunchtime. 
they thought what I did was complicated. It's not. It's very simple. I keep things simple. So we finished at lunchtime. And the light was beautiful outside. And it was in the countryside with a gorgeous lake. And it was winter time, so the sun was quite low already early on in the afternoon. I said, why don't we just go outside and take some pictures? Like, no, 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 no. Stuart, we don't need it. I said, well, you're paying for me. You're paying for this guy. Why don't we just go out and have some fun? The client said, okay, if it'll keep you happy. So we go outside and take the pictures. What did they use for the campaign? No studio shots. Not one. Everything I did outdoors. The reason for that is, and it's more common now is, it used to be, in my experience, that if a company wanted a new campaign, the first person they call is me and say, Stuart, we've got this kind of idea, loose idea, what do you think? And then we'll have the meeting, we'll discuss it, and we'll come up with some good ideas and go away and do it. And now, I get an email with lots of different references. Colin, we're over here, mate. This is Colin, everybody. <laughs> yeah, please, everybody else applaud Colin. Colin, welcome. <laughs> Colin said, I'll be here early. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 right. Uh, anyway, you're interrupted. See you later. All right. So, whereas now I tend to find that what happens is I, I, you know, I, I, get, I get these references and they say, okay, Stuart, well, this is your stylist, this is your makeup artist, this is the model, here's your art director, and here's your image, this is what we want you to do, but you know, you put your own thing on it. It's, it's, all, it's the wrong way around because it tends to be the CEO now who has to sign everything off. The images are going to come up in a short while. I did a shoot only a couple of weeks ago. Sorry, I'm boring. I did a shoot only a couple of weeks ago where it was in quite a really difficult location. It was a very overgrown location and the shadows were very heavy. So I put a smoke machine in there and the client stopped me and said, no, 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 we can't do that. We, ha we haven't signed off. We haven't got a sign off on smoke. I said, what, what do you mean you've not got a sign off? Well, well, everything has to be approved beforehand. Well, what kind of creative process is that where the creative process has to be signed off beforehand? The, that, that's not a creative process, is it? No. Anyway, I begged with the client. I said, please let me, okay, let me just do some with the smoke. You know which pictures they use, don't you? Yeah, the ones with the smoke. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's not supposed to happen either. So let me just get back to this machine and see if I can, see if I can get it to do what it's supposed to do. And let's get back on message. Okay. Now, I know there's a lot of people in this room who know how to work a computer better than me. Any volunteers? <laughs> Thanks, Mel. <laughs> what I'd like to do is be here. Ah, yes, you do know. Yes. All right. Okay. No, I'm good. It's all good. That's where I want to be. All right, thank you. Okay, so this is a brief from a com company called Clinton. You can see it's kind of, we're already been to helicopters and Land Rovers and stuff, so it was the Iceland job. So they, so they give me the brief, and this is the first job I got from this client. And this come, I'm coming back to the technology now and how I make use of it, how I exploit it. The client emailed me. The first contact was, Stuart, we like what you do. Would you do a shoot for us? And I said, yes. And they said, well, you know, we really want somebody who knows the location. And uh, are you comfortable with that? So I emailed back and said, listen, I shoot all over the world without any problem. It's no problem. And something got lost in translation. And they thought I said, Yes, I know the area. So, so they emailed back and said, oh, well, that's great. You're just what we're looking for. So, and you've got the job. So I went and I thought, okay, well, I, I could be really, really honest and email back and say, I think, so, I don't know, I, I want the job. It sounds like a lot of fun. So 
I went online and I, I found in the area photographic studios and emailed a few of them and said, are there any good assistants you can recommend? And uh, one guy stood out, so I gave him a call. I said, do you want to do this job? And he said, yeah, I'd love to. And uh, he asked me what it was. I said, right, what I want to do is, I want to sit at home using Google Earth and look at locations from above. Anything that catches my eye, I'm going to give you instructions. And because of the time difference, it meant he had them in the morning. I want to give you instructions. I want to go to that location. I want you to take pictures on the ground and email them back to me. So remotely, I was able to build up a three-dimensional image in my mind of where we should be working. And it's quite a big job. It's two days. It was a lot of locations, a big, big production. And then what I do is I build up these little maps with, I mean, this happens to be Iceland, actually, not Vancouver. But you know, with the numbers on and you pop in the number and I put a presentation together for the client. And it, the system just worked beautifully compared to having I mean, to get on an airplane, all those extra costs and inconvenience. It was just, wow. I, I'd never thought of it before, but earlier, you know, a few years ago, I couldn't have done it anyway. You know, that, that kind of technology wasn't available to me. So that's another way that the technology, modern technology, has affected my career. And I've worked like that ever since. Now, this is some of the more recent fashion photography. Now, if you can imagine in this shot, a lot of people can't understand why the sun's in the shot. Now, it's actually lit on location with flash. But the top part of the picture is where the light would be, of course. So what you do, you put the camera on a tripod and what we call lock it off. So the tripod doesn't move, the, the camera doesn't move. You shoot the shot with the girl. When the girl, then you take the girl out of the shot, you take the light out of the shot, then you take the scene again and then simply drop, drop the sky back in and rub her out. Does that make sense? Okay, we have a shot with a light in, now we have a shot with nothing in but the sky. You drop the sky on, cut everything else out, put the two together. That's, it's actually very simple, but very effective. But the whole point of this is, I'm in a technology conference, it's about the technology. I couldn't have done that without the technology, could I? All right. Now, coming back to that, I am at a technology conference. And I was a little surprised when I was asked to come and talk here. Because normally I talk to other professional photographers. So you'll have to forgive me if I'm indulging a little bit too much in the Im imagery. Well, this is who I am. This is what I do. But I do have something to say about how the technology has affected me. Not just me, but just the industry in general. So this is the kind of work you can see online on my website. It's a mixture of editorial, fashion, commercial fashion, hair and beauty, advertising, and sometimes a downright banal. But this is the kind of work I would prefer to be doing, of course, the more, the more stylish editorial work. Now, moving on from this area, I'm going to refer to my notes. I did make a few notes here, of which so far I've completely ignored. But there are one or two things that I'd really like to talk about. A lot of photographers today are very threatened by the, what I call the iPhone generation. Because everybody's a photographer. Melissa, my daughter, shoots every day. I don't. So who's the pro? You know? But of course, the images Melissa and many of you take are for an entirely different purpose. They are for micro social networking environments. So I don't see how they impact on me at all. If anything, I think it makes the general public more image savvy. You know, you're hungry for imagery. You've got a massive appetite for it because 
I, as there's a, actually says later on the presentation, you know, it's, it's a cliche, it's an old saying, but, you know, an, an image says, it speaks a thousand words, but well, certainly it does. If you're out having a really good time at a party and you want to share that feeling with your friends, you're more likely to send them a picture, aren't you, than you are to write a text, because the picture just sums it up. Yay! You know, and that, that's, that's where we are now. That's the way you guys are working. And I think that's cool. I don't think it threatens me at all, but... There are an awful lot of guys out there who do feel threatened by it. And I don't see why they should be, really. Because there's no way you can take pictures like this on your iPhone, ever. It's just not going to happen. And they're certainly not going to reproduce. I mean, these images shooting on the Hasselblad, it's a 22 million pixel camera. And it will print easily as, as big as this entire screen and still look, and still look quite fabulous. You can see a lot of the comping going on in my work where I comp the backgrounds in, where I multiply figures and so on and so forth. This is the job I was talking about with the smoke. The client was like, no, 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 we can't have any smoke. It's like, why not? You know, what's the matter with the smoke? Without the smoke, the girl, that tree was black, the background was black. You know, the creative process on this job and in general is a little bit twisted now. Now, for any of these, those of you in the audience who are used to seeing people give, deliver very slick presentations, you'll know I'm winging it right now because this thing's out of order. <laughs> but I'm doing my best, okay? All right, so what about the, uh, the future for me personally? Well, there's, we're bombarded by an endless torrent of generic, banal imagery through advertising, online and in print. And so, yes, so the industry's changed and a certain area of it has been devalued, I think. So for me personally, I'm kind of latching onto a new trend, which is there are now investors willing to invest money in artwork. So, so I've, I've, I've created, as this is my recent collection, this is early work, I'll come to the recent collection in a minute, I'm sorry, I rushed it there. And I, I've always been interested in trying to combine painting and photography, especially since we've been entirely digital, because sometimes I find the digital medium a little too sterile or lacking in, it kind of lacks soul. And so a long time ago I started work trying to introduce painting with photography. I was never happy with these pictures. They, they didn't kind of work for me. And so I kind of developed another style where I was taking a picture, then actually doing a painting. Now, this has more to do with me finding the courage to be a painter, not paint on a picture, but say, OK, get a canvas and an e easel. And that's what I've been doing the past couple of years. And the band called Skunk and Ansi, who have just finished 45 tour dates throughout Europe, festivals, very successful throughout Europe, not as well known in the UK. The BBC have a bit of a thing about them for whatever reason, but massive all over the rest of Europe. And they saw what I was doing. Well, it was Cass actually. I, I have to introduce you, Cass, but this is Cass Lewis, the bass player here. I just gone can Nancy. And Cass said, Stuart, I love I love what you're doing. Well, you know, why not put it to the band that you do something for us? And so we collaborated and produced this artwork for the last album, Black Traffic. Which was fantastic for me because it's the first time, it was before I had kind of finished what I was doing and it allowed me an opportunity to get something out there in the commercial market where I could exploit this new technique I was working on. These are extra images. I don't think these, these have been used in the campaign, have they? But they're kind of extras, yeah. yeah. So before I'd even finished my artwork collection, I had an opportunity to publish work, if you like. So thank you, Cass, that was, that was fantastic. That's the lead singer's skin. So you see, what, what, a lot of people still don't get it. They think I paint on a picture. I don't, with this technique. I have the, uh, well, in fact, I have some slides, which hopefully if it works in sequence, will demonstrate that. So I'll move on, I'll, I'll move, because I'm, I'm quite conscious of the time. That's the drummer. As Cass, of course, 
Ace, the guitarist. Skin again, the singer. So what next? What do pros have to offer? Well, before we address this question, let's have a quick look to the past. Now, these images are quite shocking, I must warn you, but they're iconic images and I think they're important and I think, they, I, I, I think it's important for me to talk about them. So what does this image tell us? Does this tell us something about society? What does it tell us about us as a human race? Or this? Or this? Or this? Or this? Or this? Well, I think the pros have plenty to offer because as much as I talk about, as I did earlier, about how a lot of people feel threatened by the, I've termed it myself, the iPhone generation. How many people with an iPhone are going to stand around to take those pictures? How many people are going to have the courage to stay around to put those pictures out and inform the world? Well, very, very few. The kind of people who do this kind of work to inform us about what's going on in the West, rest of the world whilst we sit here probably complaining about our cappuccino or the weather. It's, we need these people. These people are heroes, aren't they? So, yeah, so there is a future for professional photographers in reportage. The iPhone isn't going to take over. Facebook isn't going to take over. I don't think so. I think, I doubt that I'll have time to discuss this further, but the music industry is a good analogy in this sense in that the music industry has gone through the pains of a certain change from artists touring to promote their album to artists making an album to promote the tour. You know, the revenue streams have changed enormously and I think photography is going through a similar thing right now. A lot of people are very nervous, but I think, I think they'll get over that. I think things will turn around because you need people with a good eye, you need people with the courage. You need people with the balls to be out there and put themselves in the way of harm to be able to, to, be able to tell us what's going on in the world. Now, in one area, an exciting area of stills photography comes actually from the movie industry. There's a company in California called Red. Are you guys familiar with Red? Anybody? They, are, they have these cameras which are yeah, outrageous. They have movie capture files. The file sizes are print compatible, which means you can take one still from a moving image and print it. It's print compatible. The resolution is that high. So if you want a lot of movement in a picture, which of course as a stills photographer, you've got to shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. But with movie, of course you're not. You're just running that movie. And then you can capture one stills. So that's happening. And it's happening now. Well, they've already done it. They're doing it now. And that's going to become more and more accessible. But then again, that has its own drawbacks as well. Because if you're shooting, movies shoot at, what, 52 frames per second? So if you're shooting at 52 frames per second, my Hasselblad has an 8-bit, a 95-megabyte file every time. So forget about that. That's too big. Let's talk about a 40-megabyte file, which isn't that big. So... For you mathematicians in the room, 52 frames per second, 40 megabytes of time, do a two-minute movie, how many, how many hard drives do you think you're going to need to store the data? It's 850 million megabytes of data. And you've got to, you've got to deal with that on the fly. Then you've got to edit your frame and go, there's your magazine cover. So, you know, so that, this area has its challenges, but they're doing it. So you know, there needs to be leaps into the future to deal with you know, advances into the future to deal with the amount of data that's generated and also how to he showed me a 10 here does that mean I'm doing well? is that 10 out of 10 or is that 10 minutes? 10 minutes oh ok I can only see that going down from now on <laughs> ok so but this is, this is happening and I think uh, clearly this development is, is important. But the truth is, you know, it's great for this, but it's, but it's not so great for this. So, you know, I, so maybe I'm still in the job for a while. Now, this is a part of my art collection. So, 
So maybe, as I said earlier, it's possible for photographers like myself to go down the art route. Perhaps there's a market there. I believe, I believe there is. And I've dipped my toe into this market with uh, mixed success. Very difficult to find a gallery. Because as a photographer, the galleries tend to say, well, who are you? If it, the art world is very entrenched in who you are as much as the work you produce. But, so I'm on my own journey with this. So I've produced this uh, collection of images called Altered States. And what this allows me to do, using the Hasselblad and multiple image morphing on my Mac, is produce images that actually sort of resonate. You know, they have, they have some sincerity because it's a subject that's close to my heart. And very per based on very personal experiences, and I'm trying to visualize those. But it may help to explain how I approach the work. Now, I mentioned earlier about the painting and the photograph. Well, here I can actually show you, demonstrate that. So I, I begin with this photograph. And then this is the painting. Now, the painting is on canvas. It's this big on canvas in acrylic. But I take a shot of the painting. And then I bring the two together, which produces, for me personally, an otherworldliness about the image. So this is the final image. So this is kind of where I'm at now. I've been thinking about ceilings, you know, it's like for 10, maybe 15 years now, really. The, you know, the, the new wealth is architecture has been space. You know, people live in large minimalistic spaces with these atriums. Atriums are very, very popular, aren't they, architecturally? But where's the art gone from the ceiling? There used to be art on the ceiling, didn't there? Everywhere. So I thought, well, I, I think that look hot on the ceiling. You know, laser cut out, backlit on the ceiling. Let's, let's get some art on the ceiling again. So I'm kind of playing with ideas like this. You can really see the paint on this. Some, some of the images are very, you, what can I say, very texturized. You, you can really see the paint, the work in them, because I think the subject required that. Others, it's very, very subtle. Of course, you know, with, with, a, with a body that's in a little bit of life, it's, it's more interesting, much more interesting for me personally. You know, a pretty girl, a pretty naked girl, there's, there's not really, there's, it's not telling much of a story. Well, in fact, it's telling very little. So I, I kind of prefer the, the older people. Interesting enough as well is the, uh, these images, these portraits especially, is the looser I was with the painting, the better the result, the more. I've kind of got a little bit better as a painter because I've been doing so much, but, but the pictures are not, they're not really vibing with me for some reason. The, the experience is here, you can go online and read about what this collection is all about, but to put it in a nutshell, did, you probably already think I'm nuts anyway, so I've got nothing to lose. Now, when I was a kid, I used to think I was flying out my body. I just pop up my body and fly around all over the place. It was great. I loved it. But like, you know, Santa Claus or anybody out there, it's like, no, it's not true. It's knocked out of you, isn't it? All your dreams and your fantasies are knocked out of you. But it's never left me. I've always had this feeling that there's something other than this, the body. And so this, that's what this collection is all about. So I, but it's not always the same experience. There's a whole gamut of experiences and emotions so sometimes it's fractured and very difficult quite painful and and, and frightening sometimes sometimes it's, it's enlightening sometimes it's sensual but it was always based around the same thing so this is what my collection is about so here i am as a photographer because of the Hasselblad the technology that's available to me i can produce images like this i couldn't do this if i didn't have a mac and if where do you begin with film putting something like this? You can't do it. It's just not possible. So, as I say, please feel free to take a look at these online. You'll see them in much better resolution. I keep, <laughs> have you noticed what I'm doing? I keep pointing this at the screen. Like it's, you know, like it's my free sat 
<laughs> You're going to point it at the box. It doesn't matter where you point it. Oh, this is interesting. <clears throat> well, maybe, maybe not. But I wanted to know how it felt. Because there's, okay, two of the people in these images are professional models. Others are, I source them from uh, life modeling, you know, people who do life modeling for universities and art classes. And then some of them have never done it before. Like Liz here, the lady in the middle, I, she's my hero. She's never done a photographic shoot before. She's certainly never been in front of a camera naked before. And so, and this is my friend Jasmine with a new baby and it's, a woman who's just had a baby, you know, she feels vulnerable about her, her body. And I thought she was courageous as well. So I wanted to know how they felt. So this is me here. And so Colin, my friend, I said, Colin, I want you to shoot me. I want to know how it feels. And it's diff he's been a friend of mine for 30 years. It's freaky, I'll tell you. And it's scary. You feel so vulnerable. But what a great experience because now I know exactly how they're feeling. So now I know exactly how I can communicate with them. And that helped me a lot. Otherwise, I don't think I could have got the results I got out of these people. So I, I think they're absolutely fantastic. But without asking Colin to shoot me, I, I don't think I could have got there. These are detail shots, of course, of these groups. Now, how I shot these was, very quickly, 20 minute sessions with each model, just a black velvet cloth. 20 minutes, and my number's going down, I'm getting five now. <laughs> Just kept shooting them, gave them a feeling, okay, there's somebody here next to you. You may be communicating with somebody here. You can see it in the images. And so I just ended up with this enormous amount of data. And then you can imagine editing, it was quite difficult, putting all these figures together to produce something that resonated with me, you know, the, the story I was trying to tell. So it took, it took quite a while. With the painting and all the comping, about six months altogether. Not, of course, every single day, but every minute I had available when I wasn't working commercially. So, what I'd like to do now that we just have a a few minutes, we're pretty much at the end of the uh, presentation, is ask you guys if you have any questions. You know, are there any aspects of what you've seen which kind of resonate with you or maybe you want some technical questions? Yes, please, yes, yeah, speak up. Yeah, uh, I think you touched on it briefly earlier, um, but do you find uh, that a lot of time clients are asking you to um, make models appear thinner or uh, elongate their necks or no. um, to try and um, to try and make a model appear more unobtainable to yes, the young people? That, that definitely yes yeah and not yeah it's not real. I'd, I wouldn't like to think for a minute that what I do is produce images that depict real life in any way. It's all idealised, isn't it? Now, when it comes to making girls thinner or so on and so forth, very rarely. And there are, different, there are different levels in every industry. There are the wannabes and there are those that... I'm quite a thin guy and I'm 58. Imagine what I look like when I was 16. Nobody pointed a finger at me and said I'm damaging other people. I was just having to be skinny and ate as much as I wanted. And the girls I work with, they're, they're tall, thin girls. They tend to eat whatever they want. They pig out like crazy in the studio. But, you know, but... The Daily Mail or the Sun or the Star or whatever, you know, that the tabloid newspapers tell a very different story. The girls are anorexic, they starve themselves. But there's one universal truth that if a girl's doing this, if she's unhealthy, you can see it and you don't want to take a picture. I don't want to work with her. She looks unhealthy. You know, you can always see it under the eyes. And there are girls like that, yes. Of course, as I touched on it earlier, there's always the vulnerable and it's, and it's sad. It's different elsewhere. I've seen some pretty scary things in Paris and Milan where the girls are forced to lose weight. Well, here's a funny thing. You see with the magazines, for example, the editorial market, occasionally there's a, a campaign to have more realistic uh, women featured in these magazines. And every time, you remember Sophie Dahl, for example, that was quite a big deal. Uh, Sophie Dahl came along and Nick Knight did those beautiful, curvaceous images of her. 
which were incredibly manipulated, by the way. And uh, our sales just plummeted. I, you know, everybody's going, yeah, you know, the people championing this movement, saying let's have more re realistic models. But they stopped buying the magazine. And so people started going out of business. So, it, so when do you begin with that? You know, it's, so I've not got a quick answer to that. But in my world, no, if a girl's like that, she's unhealthy and it doesn't interest me. I do like tall, slim women, per se. But uh, that's just my own personal preference. But when it comes to work, and here's the, here's the thing. Sampling, sample sizes, designer sample sizes. Every country has a block, what they call a block. Does anybody know about a block? What a sample block may be? Okay, a block is a standard which each nation conforms to. So, in Italy, Italian suits suit people who are tall and fairly slim, don't they? Because their block is tall and slim. You're not going to sell as many Italian suits in Russia as you are in Spain, Great Britain, and, uh, and so on and so forth. German block is different to a British man's block. British man's block doesn't suit me very well because I'm a little bit too slim for it. It would fit you much better. A German block would fit you better because you're built. In other words, you are more standard in Germany than I am. Okay? It's the same with women's clothes. And the reason why this exists is because you can't, it's unrealistic to expect designers to produce sample collections in a range of sizes because they simply can't afford it, it's uneconomical. So therefore, there's an industry standard and it happens to be tall and slim and because it looks good on camera. And that's it, it's mechanical, it's economical. It's got nothing to do with trying to starve the nation. Nothing whatsoever, it's about that. Does that answer your question? Cool. Anybody else? Oh, sorry, yes. Has the makeup improved as much as the beauty I need to tell you it has? Do we need a microphone for this? Because we're streaming online. I don't know, say it again. Sorry, have, has the makeup for the models improved as much as the beauty editors tell us it has? <laughs> oh. <laughs> now, listen, guys, we're down to. Oh, I've got three minutes, yeah? I've got. Oh, it's over. Okay, well, listen, it, it, it's over. Our time's out. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, may I say thank you for inviting me here. Because, well, I mean, what a cool place. It's just fantastic, isn't it? So I've had a ball looking round. Uh, Cass and I early went on the 3D printer thing. Have you, been, have you seen the 3D printing? It's brilliant, isn't it? I held my hat like that. It's like, dead still. You want to see it? It looks amazing. So, uh, yeah, and we struck a deal. So if you go on the 3D printing thing, a little tip is they're on to discounting. Just telling you you're a bit famous or something. Anyway, so thank you very much, everybody. All right.